Hello everyone and welcome to the third session of the Dispersed Program of CTM Festival 2021. My name is Aneta Yori and one of the curators of the Discourse Program, so I hope you have been enjoying it since yesterday. And the title of this session is Electronic Cities, Music Policies and Space in the 21st Century. And um, it, this is the same title of a book which is uh, coming out actually in March 2021, edited by Sebastian Darshan, Damien Sharara and also John Wilstead. And they are also here, in the, not in the studio, but somewhere else around the world, and they will talk about the book also later on. And my Whole, the whole role here today is just to say some words about the panel and then introduce also the moderator of this panel who is going to be Sebastian Darshan. So as the title suggests, uh, we are going to go through different case studies um, and scenes of electronic dance music scenes from all around the world, including Africa, Middle East, Europe, Asia, North America and Australia. And some of them are selected here for today and there will be some different uh, speakers about about those different topics. And uh, so I would say that the keywords for this panel are going to be local policies, gentrification, commodification, club closings, and transformation of urban space. So I would say that the last uh, keyword was the reason why we wanted to build together this panel to hear a little bit about what's going on all around the world, because I guess since almost all the cities all around the world are in the same situation with this gentrification and commodification actions and club scenes. So now I would like to introduce Sebastian, who is going to be the moderator of this uh, panel, who you can already see. Uh, Sebastian holds a PhD in urban studies, and he was an assistant professor at the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University. Then in 2011, he joined the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Queensland, Australia, where he is a senior lecturer in planning. His research interests include urban regeneration, urban and regional regional planning, creative industries, and globalization. His articles have been published in journals such as Urban Studies or Cities. And he's also the main editor of the book Global Planning Innovations for Urban Sustainability, published in 2019 by Routledge. So Sebastian, the word is yours and welcome. Thank you, Anita. Um, so before you, you hear about the different case studies with different panelists, um, I thought I would just explain a, a little bit about the, group, the book concept and, and the idea for this book. So um, I was always fascinated with music and cities. And so this, this book is really about exploring the link between music and place and music and cities. Um, so we look in the book at different policies um, impacting um, positively or, or neg negatively different um, electronic music scenes in different city contexts. Um, we see electronic music in the con continuity of other um, genres like punk or post-punk or even, even rock music, but the book um, focuses exclusively on electronic music. So in terms of policies, we're looking at planning policies, um, also the regulation of the nightlife, um, cultural policies, also policies linked to tourism as well that might influence the development of those scenes in cities. Um, the book is pretty global. We look at 18 cities ac across the, the world. Um, it's organized in three sections. So the first section is more about um, the historical scenes, as we call them. Um, so scenes like Berlin, London, or um, also Manchester, where it, where it all started. Um, the second section is more on what we call established scenes, like Toronto or Montreal, um, that were not necessarily there from the beginning, but you know, a lot of EDM stars like Grimes or Denmark 5 are coming from those scenes now. So we call them established scenes. And the third section is more on the recent scenes. We call, um, we call them uh, emerging electronic scenes. Um, and today we have three panelists. Damien will be talking about Hong Kong. Uh, Ruxandra will be talk talking about Romania. And um, Leila will be talking about Accra and Ghana. So those scenes are a bit more recent, um, but very evolving very fast and producing a lot of um, interesting artists. Um, but this is a bit the structure of the book in, in three different sections. 
Um, one of the challenges, to be honest, was really to define what is electronic music, uh, and we've, did, we've, we've tried to do that in the introduction. Um, as you know, electronic music is evolving very fast. Um, today, there are around 153 different subgenres of electronic music, and it's still evolving, so this was a bit of a challenge. Um, but obviously, we try our best in, in chapter one to, to define what is this music, right? Um, the book is an academic book, but we also want um, to widen the audience as well. So we're hoping that um, you know people passionate about cities and music um, will actually buy the book and read it. Um, for example, John Wilstead did an interview um, with Mark Reeder, who is a, a famous um, electronic music producer. So some of the chapters are not as academic as others. Um, it's mainly an academic book, but we're hoping that um, the audience will be quite large um, because of the topic, because of it's about electronic music. Um, so the idea of the panel today is to give you an overview of the book with different case studies, selected case studies. So each panelist will talk for 10 minutes about the city or a country in relation to um, electronic music. So the first um, panelist is Dr. John Wilstead. Um, John is also one of the editors for Electronic Cities. Um, John teaches music and sound at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, where I'm also working. Uh, John has played and recorded with many bands, um, but now he's also an academic. Um, and John will be talking about electronic music in uh, this country we call Australia. Over to you, John. Uh, thank you, Dr. Darshan. Uh, hi there. Uh, first up, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work, um, land whose sovereignty was never ceded, where generations of Turrbal and Jagera people lived and worked and played and shared stories like we're doing now. We pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and stand in sovereignty with the Uluru Statement from the Heart and their ongoing resistance against colonisation. Um, yeah, uh, Sebastian pointed out I'm a musician and um, uh, I'm in my 60s now. I've been doing it quite a long time. Um, sometimes I wonder why, but uh, it's uh, late at night here and I'm getting older, so I'll, I'll just try and kind of keep myself focused. Um, I started out uh, in my teens being a musician and then somewhere in my 30s I became a filmmaker and then somewhere in my 40s I became an academic and uh, all of these things sort of pointed me towards um, having an interest in this place where I live. I live in Brisbane which is uh, on the east coast of Australia um, and it's a, a city but a small city and um, but it has quite a potent kind of cultural history and um, my uh, my sort of skills as a as a I suppose as a as a storyteller which came which sort of rose up through music and through filmmaking uh, as a sound editor uh, and a composer really started to inform um, the way I thought about this place and and uh, the history that it contained and um, so ideas about music and place um, kind of played into uh, my PhD work and the work that I've done since, most of which is kind of centred around the history of uh, punk and post-punk scenes uh, here in Brisbane. And I see those scenes as being, uh, or those genres maybe as being uh, almost like a geography or something which I'm just constantly traversing and uh, uh, digging into and uncovering uh, uh, histories and then trying to make something from that that uh, that stuff. Um, exhibitions are right about this stuff. I perform music uh, uh, um, uh, uh, or collaborate with the cultural institutions around um, trying to make sense of the history of the town in which um, I live. Brisbane is quite a long way from the, uh, I suppose, the two biggest uh, cities in Australia, Sydney and Melbourne. Australia itself is also quite a long way from uh, the rest of the world. And in the 
uh, say, 60s and 70s, uh, when this, uh, this electronic music that we're talking about, when it, I suppose it kind of rose up from, uh, from uh, you know, a, a, a range of different kind of um, places. Uh, here in Australia, we were very separated from the rest of the world. It was uh, expensive and difficult to get here. Uh, in the in the late 1940s, it took something like uh, uh, you know four weeks to get uh, to fly from Europe to Australia, 42 stops, and and uh, by the time the 1970s had come around, that that had changed naturally. But still, uh, the uh, uh, accessibility, in a sense, to um, uh, technology and uh, culture from the rest of the world was limited and um, uh, so the, the this kind of rise of electronic music in Australia really happened in uh, uh, institutions that could afford uh, to be able to support this sort of uh, technology and uh, they were usually universities or conservatoria um, and so in the 70s the sort of uh, musicians who were uh, uh, I suppose using this technology were um, mostly jazz musicians. So what we're talking about is a kind of experimental electronic music that uh, that is the the uh, the beginnings of the electronic music scene in Australia. Um, this happened, of course, at a time when the pervading uh, music form was uh, what we would call pub rock. So it was just really straightforward rock and roll. Uh, happening in the suburbs, produced in the cities, and uh, but this but electronic music that kind of came up through the mid '70s was um, uh, it kind of existed in the kind of in the fringes of the jazz world, um, and in talking about uh, electronic music in Australia, uh, it's really essential to uh, I suppose to not just discuss the commercial scene, but also to always acknowledge the the experimental. Um, because it's always been so strong here. You know, it's a small population um, and, and niches survive quite well, um, mainly due to the isolation. So uh, there has always been, since the 1970s, uh, this experimental uh, electronic music. Uh, and, and in a way, that's how, uh, that's how I sort of got into uh, uh, this using electronics and the music that I've been making since the 70s. Um, one of the kind of aspects of, of uh, music making in Australia has always been um, di DIY and, and because it was essential because of this, uh, you know, the lack of access to technology, the lack of access to recording studios and so forth, people were using analogue technology to um, just to do whatever they could in in this in the uh, situations that they were in, touring was really quite difficult once again because of the isolation, and an audience was reasonably difficult to find, um, just because of the size of the population here. So, um, well, there were small scenes, but they were potent. I think is probably a good way of describing it, um, and and so from the uh, from this kind of early to mid seventies. Um, uh, punk arrived and, and uh, you know, Brisbane is um, well placed, I suppose, in the kind of history of um, punk music because uh, I'll use that term pretty kind of loosely. Um, uh, the Saints uh, uh, who released a, a kind of what, what is described, what was described then as a kind of punk single, I'm Stranded, before uh, the Sex Pistols first single came out was a uh, you know, that's a kind of, I suppose, a big thing for Brisbane to kind of that it that it had arrived on a, um, an international kind of stage with uh, original music that came from the suburbs. Um, but one of the things that sort of punk brought with it in as far as Brisbane is concerned was that DIY attitude. Um, uh, you know, any, anybody can do anything. Uh, we use what we had um, and it wasn't, of course, um, uh, simply relegated to music. The uh, music was part of a broader culture, fanzines, small format magazines, 
poster making, fashion, uh, uh, filmmaking, photography, all of these things kind of were uh, all, all used by a, a bunch of uh, often multidisciplinary artists. Um, many of the, and this is of course not at all uncommon, you know, many, many uh, musicians uh, came to music through through art school or, uh, you know, um, and, and th this was uh, pr a pretty kind of strong thing here that, that, that uh, people um, uh, spread their, um, I suppose, their work across a number of different discipline areas. And, and the other, I suppose, the other thing that we're, that, that was, um, I suppose, universal at the time is that we're heading towards the end of um, analog technology, not the end of it, but certainly it had reached a kind of a peak and the beginnings of digital technology, which arrived in the, in the 80s. Um, uh, so I suppose the, this influence from universities through music, experimental music and, uh, and students with different interests uh, a kind of where punk kind of bled into uh, this experimental music and uh, I suppose some industrial sort of uh, music arrived at this time. Uh, the beginnings of dance music as well in the very early 80s. Uh, the rise of small labels was really important, not so much here in Brisbane, um, but in Sydney, uh, there was a great label called M Squared, for instance, which uh, was a largely uh, experimental music label, a lot of electronic music. And I, I think it's it's pretty, I'd be right in saying that um, most electronic music, certainly at this time, which we're talking just before the kind of arrival of uh, dance music and DJs was, is, is this kind of blend between, uh, you know, uh, guitars, drum machines, synthesizers, and uh, the use of the recording studio as, as a medium. So this is, uh, you know, it's not a very pure form. It's quite, um, it, uh, it's quite sort of blended. Um, and about this time in the late seventies, early eighties, there are two uh, technical innovations, um, which I'd just like to draw your attention to. Uh, Kim Ryrie and Peter Vogel developed the Fairlight CMI in Australia, and the Fairlight's a really important instrument in relation to um, uh, the ongoing development of sampling. Um, Fairlight was uh, a sampler, a synthesizer, and a digital audio workstation, and it was picked up by Peter Gabriel and Kate Bush, Trevor Horn, Thomas Dolby, in the States by Stevie Wonder and Herbie Hancock. And it was a really important instrument in, in uh, changing the way electronic music was uh, approached um, uh, in that uh, it was, even though it was very expensive, uh, it, it sort of opened the door to uh, the technology that followed. And it enabled uh, a lot of, um, uh, enabled innovation in a lot of other areas as well. Uh, and the other innovation that I'd like to draw attention to as well uh, is really a person and his name's Stephen Jones. Uh, Stephen Jones, um, in 1975, I was an architecture student at a university in Brisbane and uh, Stephen Jones came uh, to Brisbane in order to, uh, I, could, I suppose, spread the word about how uh, this is mid seventies, um, video technology had was changing and he was uh, giving workshops in how to use uh, video gear and Stephen went on to uh, work as a video artist through the 1970s doing installations and uh, interdisciplinary work with dancers and stuff but I, th I think he's really important because he worked with SPK and Laughing Hands but he also had a 10 year period where he worked from uh, 1982 with Severed Heads and Severed Heads are probably uh, through the 80s uh, were Australia's, I think, most popular, most uh, successful um, uh, uh, dance music act or electronic music act. Uh, and Stephen um, did live uh, video synthesis with, uh, with Severed Heads for those 10 years, uh, as well as making all the film clips. John, we, we have to go. Do you have an, uh, like another minute? We have to go to the next one. Or? Oh, yeah, sure. I can or... just do a minute. That's easy. Yeah, I was just kinda, okay. 
Yeah, of course, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, I suppose that has been uh, has kind of is clear at the moment is that I was going to kind of talk about uh, rave culture in this part of the world, but uh, you know that it which kind of rose and fall in the same way as it did in the UK. But the main thing I suppose in relation to uh, uh, policy, uh, which has kind of happened in the last little while, is the decimation of uh, nightclubs and venues uh, since the uh, arrival of the pandemic. Even though the country has approached the pandemic uh, in a variety of ways, we have a federal government, a series of state governments, and even though the, the, the virus has been managed quite well from a health uh, perspective, the uh, the support from the federal government uh, has really supported venues rather than artists. And uh, so there was money, a, a program called Job Seeker, which uh, enabled venues to continue to pay um, uh, their staff. But of course, um, musicians and DJs and so forth are not really staff. And so the, uh, the, the musicians and artists in Australia have uh, suffered particularly badly in the last year and that has uh, not yet resolved itself. And I, I reckon that'll do me. Thank you, John. Um, thanks so much. The second panelist is um, Dr. Stéphane Sadou. Um, Stéphane teaches at the University of Grenoble in France, in France, and one of his research areas is alternative urban culture and electronic music. Um, and Stéphane will talk today about the underground genre um, acid techno in London. So it's over to you, Stéphane. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Hello, everyone. Delighted to be here with you all. Um, I'll, I'll kick this off by uh, saying that um, overall, I think the uh, the contribution that London made to electronic music has been limited, uh, but that existing literature and particularly academic material has, uh, in my view, tended to uh, forget certainly parts of the narrative. And, and one omission, I believe, it clearly is the 25-year-old uh, acid techno scene. Now, I'd say that there's something quite specific and different about acid techno in London. And uh, I'm sure all of you who've tuned in today will know uh, what acid refers to when it's applied to a, a music genre. But just in case, I'll, uh, I'll point out or remind you anyway that it, it refers to um, you know, productions that essentially rely on the rather distinctive sound made by uh, Roland TB3 when the sound is distorted. And in, in London, the um, the story of acid techno starts in, in the early 1990s, uh, at a time when the city's uh, urban fabric had been you know, radically reshaped by um, industrial decline and had uh, certainly left uh, uh, many, many spaces and, and buildings vacant. And you have a rather striking example of this sort of area in, in, on, on my virtual background. And it's in these um, specific areas that uh, a community of people and an artist met and they, they lived in squats at the time and they got together, met and experimented and gave birth to what I would refer to and many people refer to as London acid techno as a specific subgenre. And too many individuals have been involved in this to, to, to name them all. So I'll just quote the liberated DJs, obviously, Chris Aaron and Julian, uh, Dave the drummer, uh, people like Laurie Immersion and Giza, but there were, of course, lots of others. Now, um, the, the point to make, I think, is that all of these artists felt that they didn't really belong to the mainstream and sort of, you know, emerging. Uh, they, they also uh, felt that the, the music they wanted to produce or listen to and even play in their own parties didn't quite exist at the time. So they, they got together and started to produce their own tracks. And what, what emerged from all this process was a, a rather distinctive type of music. Uh, the tempo of London Acid Techno is actually quite high, uh, usually well above the 145 beats per minute range. So th this, I think, probably explains why uh, you would typically not hear these sort of tracks in, in mainstream techno, uh, techno parties uh, unless they've been, you know, uh, pitched down quite a bit. The, uh, the use of the TB303 is also quite specific and that the sound isn't bleepy as it would be in, in most acid techno or indeed in acid house, but uh, London acid techno 
tends to scream at you. you know, the, the, the use of the filters is actually quite different. And um, uh, another important thing, which would probably echo some of uh, John's points uh, he, he made just before me, is that um, uh, usually, usually most London Acetechno uh, tracks tend to rely on the use of uh, traditional analog drum machines and, you know, more specifically, Roland's uh, 909 with its rather distinctive kicks, snares and hi-hat. So for those of you who want to explore this further, I would recommend um, um, looking at the Stereo Forever Collective, you can find them easily on, on the internet and they, they tend to bring together all of the labels and artists that have contributed to this genre. Now, one key point that emerged from the interviews I, I did with the artists is that, um, you know, again, the, the importance of the DIY culture, do it yourself, that again, John mentioned in his own uh, talk just before me. And this obviously in London applies to squatting as a way of life, you know, you sort of do whatever you can in the place you're living in. Uh, but it also applied to music production uh, in the way that artists, uh, you know, uh, uh, used low-cost equipment in home studios. Um, I think another important thing about uh, London Acid Techno is the fact that uh, if you look at the interaction between various genres of music, a number of these pioneers who, who created this, this Acid Techno uh, in London are actually accomplished musicians in other genres, and that there's a, a lot of crossover uh, between the punk scene, certainly. Now, um, clearly, I'd say that acid techno is in, in, in London uh, is, is part of the underground culture. And uh, I think probably everyone here today will agree that it's quite difficult to find definitions of the word underground. So I, I decided that part of my work for this research would be to ask artists to you know, identify with this culture to, to actually define this. So I'll, I'll just pick up a few points. The first thing they mentioned is that um, uh, the underground culture is about making, for music anyway, it's about making music for, for, for passion rather than money. Um, it's also uh, about uh, seeing, seeing the underground as, as a cultural space in which you can express yourself in a different way and uh, certainly a place in which you can test things that would not be acceptable or viable. Maybe and the other interesting I thought, uh, point I thought about um, the, the, all, all of this in terms of space, maybe, is that uh, um, quite a few people said, you know, what, what really is different about the underground scene is that everyone mingles. You can actually talk to the DJs during an underground event, which is clearly something that wouldn't tend to happen in the mainstream. Now, um, I think it, it would be wrong to assume that the uh, underground scene only thrives in squat parties, uh, and the acid techno scene has thrived in squat parties. Um, um, so some London clubs are underground, those to the left anyway, and I'll just tell a, few, uh, a short story now, if I may. Um, the story starts with a statistic, and as I'm sure you will know, London lost many of its nightclubs, 40% between 2008 and 2016, and this, of course, was well before the pandemic, which is making things worse. And um, interestingly, um, nightlife has been a concern for all mayors in London. Uh, Ken Livingston, the first one, uh, suggested that nine life should actually be integrated in the planning strategy. Boris Johnson, who was mayor after uh, Livingston, set up a specific task force. Uh, did quite a lot for, for music venues too. And uh, but but of course, you know, club closures have been due to a number of factors, and uh, some have been related to the safety of clubbers. But overall, I think it's fair to say that most of them, most of the clubs have actually closed because of urban change and uh, regeneration. Some might argue gentrification. I'll come to this in a second. Uh, but th there's a more worrying trend, and, and this is um, something to do with leases. Um, because most of the time, people who own the clubs uh, as a business, I mean, don't actually own the building in which the club is located. And um, of, of course, there comes a time when, you know, more profitable uh, uses, land uses, will encourage landlords to not to renew the lease. And particularly in London, obviously, when, uh, you know, real estate pressure is very high, obviously, luxury housing will provide more rent and therefore income than an underground venue. Now, uh, just by way of illustration, I'll say a few words about Club 414, which uh, I think reflects the situation. The uh, the club used to be located in Brixton in, in South London. It was opened in the mid-1980s when the area was a no-go zone, a no-man's land, uh, just after some severe riots. And the club first opened as a reggae venue um, and, and then moved on to electronic music and quickly became one of the hotspots uh, in, in, in town and certainly one of the legal 
homes of the London acid techno community that used to organize, you know, mostly squad parties in illegal places. Now, uh, the club owners didn't own the building. And in 2016, a first planning application was submitted by the landlords who wanted to convert the place into uh, retail and housing. Several hundred objections were submitted. But uh, despite this, the local planning authority actually granted permission the case was taken to high court and uh what's interesting here is that the uh, the planning authority ended up withdrawing from the process and the planning permission was squashed and and uh what what is somewhat ironic is that the high court decision was totally based on the fact that uh the 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 local authority had actually failed to take into account its own draft local plan that uh, made a number of provisions to safeguard nighttime venues such as clubs um, and, and these new provisions were, you know, a direct consequence, I think, of the proactive approach taken by Sadiq Khan when he was mayor of London, uh, in the sense that uh, he's um, been issuing quite a lot of additional planning guidance, uh, which needs to be taken into account by lower tier, so local planning authorities, boroughs in, in particular, when they come up with their own local plan. So um, the, this is illustrated in second planning application that was put in the following year by, by the landlords who wanted to turn the place this time into a cocktail bar. And what happened? Well, this time the permission was actually refused because planning saying, you know, you need to make sure that the uh, nightlife is diverse, we need to protect clubs and all of this. So I think what, what this clearly shows is that things have changed, things are changing, perhaps not enough, but nightlife is certainly being um, uh, taken into account. Um, but there's only so much you can do, so only so much planning can do, and uh, the story uh, goes on in 2019 when, when the premises were sold and the new landlords did not offer to renew the lease. So whereas, you know, as I said, planning can support nightclubs and nightlife in a way, for the moment there is very little planning and institutions can do when a landlord decides not to renew a lease. So for the moment, Club 414 uh, still exists as a business, uh, but it no longer has premises. Um, by way of conclusion, because I know I've only got less than a minute to go, so I'll, I'll just wrap up. Um, what is quite interesting, I think, today um, is, is in the context of the pandemic, is that um, in, in London, as in, in most European and probably world cities, um, there is a huge resurgence of illegal parties. So perhaps this is something we can pick up later uh, in, in the discussion. But one of the things certainly I'm wondering is, is you know, the extent to which the the uh, underground culture will will sort of renew its its tradition of, of of illegal parties and the extent to which public policy can actually take this on board because it's obviously something no one was prepared to deal with, and certainly not uh, on this scale. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, so our third panelist is um, Sarah Ross. Um, Sarah teaches at Dalhousie University in Halifax, New Brunswick, Canada. Her research looks at the intersection of law, culture, and the city. She just published a book uh, entitled Law and Intangible Cultural Heritage in the City with Routledge. And Sarah will talk to us today about electric music in Toronto. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here with everyone speaking today. Uh, so the focus of my case study or my chapter was uh, the drum and bass scene in Toronto, uh, but as couched within uh, the city's larger electronic music landscape and its development over um, a 20 year period. So the initial project uh, was carried out from a legal anthropology approach that I started during my PhD in law. Uh, but it grew out of my own interest in this area for, for many years and my time spent kind of in the in that area. And the, the reason for my focus on drum and bass uh, here in, in Toronto um, is the notable longevity and prominence of drum and bass in Toronto and its particularly influential role in the flourishing of other drum and bass scenes uh, across Canadian cities. So uh, like Vancouver, Montreal, Edmonton, Halifax and, and others. And so for those uh, who might not be familiar with drum and bass, uh, bass is, as the name um, indicates, a central um, component. And the uh, the BPM generally ranges from uh, 150 to 180. Uh, it has its roots in uh, breakbeat music, dub, uh, reggae influences, and there's frequent sampling uh, and the integration of noise and other effects, um, as well as a syncopated heavy bass rhythm. Uh, it can range even more specifically in styles and subgenres from dark and funky aesthetic to driving to atmospheric and melodic. 
So while the drama based scene uh, in Toronto doesn't still feature all of those who kind of paved the early years, there's still some key figures around like Marcus Visionary, for example, um, who are still active in curating the ongoing longevity of, of drama base in Toronto. And the same applies to the community. So uh, some members have been around since the, you know, quote unquote, early days. Uh, and there are others who are you know, much newer to the scene who attend the, the same events um, and often have just recently been able to get into licensed 19 plus uh, venues. Uh, in terms of the spaces for electronic music more generally in Toronto over the years, uh, my chapter kind of traces the shifting use and availability of different kinds of venues. So from the early uh, raw warehouse style venues like Twilight Zone, 23 Hop, RPM, uh, and underground raves that were held in large event spaces and unused buildings, parking lots, other kinds of alternative spaces, you could say, uh, where the location would be released the day of the event uh, by calling a phone number. And then the chapter goes on to uh, kind of trace the shift of these, these music events into more reliably available 19 plus licensed spaces uh, as a response to a crackdown on the raves that were being held in these abandoned warehouses and other unlicensed spaces. And, uh, and this happened after the well-publicized death of one attendee at one of these events. And this is where, as my chapter uh, goes into, one particular venue eventually became a set of venues uh, served an important role. And so this space I'll talk about a bit for a bit uh, came to be known as the government complex, uh, government with a U. And it was located within the post-industrializing portlands along a portion of Toronto's waterfront. So government uh, kind of provided a space uh, at the upper end of the mid-size venue range uh, in order to accommodate a crowd from about, about 2,000 to 3,000 people. And it also served as a particularly central place for the ongoing uh, development of not only electronic music in Toronto, but also for the ongoing development uh, and flourishing of drum and bass. And in a way that really no other venue of this size has done for drum and bass in Canada and, and really um, much of North America. But in the context of ongoing displacement of music venues over the years, and notably within the kind of post-industrial shift in Toronto, where these unused, um, unwanted areas of the city gradually began to be incorporated into um, you know, the fold of mixed use development and speculation. Uh, the displacement of this particular venue by private develop, uh, development that was, was locally celebrated by the mayor and the municipal government. Um, it's an acute example of the realities of displacement, uh, despite one of the, um, we heard this from the, the past speaker, of one of the, despite one of the specific policy developments uh, that my chapter turns to. And this is Toronto's ongoing uh, strategic cultural policy or goal or priority of becoming a quote unquote music city. And that began uh, to arise about seven to eight years ago. Uh, so this displacement that government and other venues were, were facing was and is still happening alongside and uh, despite this concerted effort to celebrate Toronto's music scenes, music spaces and culture, uh, to celebrate local musical innovation, um, and also happened alongside the development of Toronto's music office, music advisory council, uh, music venue task force, and uh, and numerous studies that we're looking into how to encourage, promote, and, and commodify Toronto's uh, music scenes. So venues that were uh, important to these stated objectives, like government, uh, continue to be dis the, uh, displaced. And in the case of uh, the government complex, they are sometimes even replaced um, with a city-sanctioned, uh, city-supported, and sometimes city or provincially funded arts-focused development uh, where essentially what, what we see is a replacement of one vibrant space of music, performance and culture, um, but one that kind of takes place predominantly at night or, or might be coded as an alternative type of space, and a replacement of this with another space for music, art and performance, but uh, one that is city sanctioned or promoted by the city and which occurs on you know, the first few floors of a condo building or a mixed use building uh, is the kind of space that tends to feature events and programming during only the more traditionally uh, dominant hours of the daytime hours before 11 p.m. Um, so those kind of air, uh, hours of the day night spectrum. So nonetheless, despite the overarching lack of responsiveness of the City of Toronto and its new music-oriented strategies and music office, uh, to really what, what much of uh, many music, uh, music and musicians, 
uh, especially the less kind of mainstream uh, music producers, consumers, and performers uh, have expressed is, is needed to, uh, uh, to avoid this loss, ongoing loss of vibrant uh, music ecosystem in Toronto. Uh, notably, that's in, in light of this counteractive policy development and implementation of music cultural policy that we saw with the displacement of uh, the government complex. Uh, there's there's recently been in the last few years, but pre-COVID, of course, keep in mind, a uh, slow growing recognition um, on the part of the city of the role and importance of relatively small DIY or do-it-yourself spaces uh, and events, uh, which was relevant to explore for my chapter, as these are also currently quite important to uh, the electronic music landscape in Toronto. So while there was a long period of kind of wheel spinning, uh, fruitless consultations and, and you know, toothless legislation generated over the years while the DIY community, you know, vocally communicated to Toronto's new music office and new music advisory uh, council what they needed, uh, a recent report that was commissioned by the City of Toronto's Economic Development and Cultural Division focused specifically on understanding the challenges to access and space uh, faced by DIY spaces and events in the city. And, and much of these challenges speak to what electronic music advanced spaces and DJs have faced over the years uh, without any recourse to protective urban policy um, and legislation. So the recommendations within the report uh, note the merits of the centralized permitting process for music events held in unconventional spaces, uh, the local implementation of agent of change principle that might provide a, a means of protection from displacement for pre-existing music venues um, due to noise complaints from the new neighbors. Um, the understanding that some of these events and spaces uh, place a lot of importance and serve an important role as all ages venues and the need for context sensitive enforcement uh, when it comes to venues that are struggling to meet fire safety capacity building code requirements uh, and an acknowledgement of the of the incredible burden that property taxes levied on spaces based on their highest and best use uh, rather than a current existing use create uh, you know, when uh, they could potentially be more financially lucrative um, with, than other, you know, with other endeavors or potential uses for the space. And these are also some of the mechanisms that would have helped kind of the early scene in Toronto. Uh, finally, I just wanted to talk a bit about uh, what Toronto DJs and uh, electronic music spaces and music collectives are doing to survive the COVID context when nothing can be open and no events can take place. So one development has been the growing presence of electronic music collectives, um, music spaces on Twitch, uh, which is a, you know, I'm, I'm sure you may be familiar, a live uh, streaming plat a platform that's actually usually for gamers um, that's taken off within the electronic music community, uh, communities here for, you know, either regular or sporadic events. Uh, and individual DJs too have also taken to having these events uh, or performance schedule on Twitch. Um, so for a more tightly knit scene like the drum and bass scene in Canadian cities, um, this kind of provides an ability to still gather with the community um, over music and chat. But another interesting um, outcome has been the expansion of the local community to a more global community for local DJs who didn't previously, uh, previously have access to that, you know, weren't really touring, couldn't really travel. Um, and they're now gaining an audience and fo uh, followers from around the world. Uh, so the community that, that joins or streams regularly has expanded beyond just the local community. Um, and so for those familiar with the Twitch platform, there's a small ability to make money doing live streams, but it isn't really that lucrative. Uh, but the attraction can be that, you know, the DJ would be, um, you know, playing in their home anyways. Um, and so they're just kind of live streaming it instead. And the reality too is that, uh, you know, if not, most DJs weren't really making that much money locally anyway, so that's not necessarily a concern. Anyways, that's uh, that's all for me, so I will leave it there. Thank you, Sarah. The next panelist is Ruxandra Chanda for you. Um, Ruxandra is a reader in media and communication at Edge Hill University in England. Among other things, she studies the potential of social media to support the political engagement and actions of marginalized groups. And I talk today will be on EDM, EDM festivals in Romania. Over to you, Roxandra. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for the opportunity to talk uh, mainly about my hometown and the development of electronic dance music in Cluj. Um, Cluj-Napoca is a city of less than um, half a million people in Northwest Romania um, on the Eastern edge of Europe. And um, is considered the unofficial cultural capital of the traditional um, region of Transylvania. 
Now, one wouldn't necessarily um, think of Cluj as the predilect location for electronic music uh, scene. However, um, since 2013, the nearby uh, village of Bonsida hosts the highly successful Electric Castle Festival. And since 2015, um, the city of Cluj itself is the site of the largest EDM festival in Eastern Europe, untold. Um, alongside, uh, genre-specific clubs and smaller events have also been thriving um, in a place that until recently had no tradition of electronic music. So how did this happen? Well, you could say that Cluj had two things going for it. Um, it is a university town with a relatively uh, young and dynamic audience. And it has um, um, a thriving music scene, particularly classic music and, um, and jazz. However, um, during the socialist period, um, audiences throughout Romania would not have had access to electronic sounds, with the rare exception of DJs playing electronic music uh, in clubs on the Black Sea coast, um, occasional tapes smuggled from Western Europe, or the rare program on banned foreign radio stations. In the 1970s, um, Rodion Roshka, an engineer from Cluj, began building synthesizers in his own home and put together a small band mixing progressive rock, psychedelic metal and electronic music. However, um, although they, um, uh, they toured uh, for a while, um, their music was never um, produced properly or recorded. So after the fall of communism in 1989, audiences um, were eager to get into music that um, they would have been prevented from hearing uh, previously. So clubs and DJs playing electronic music uh, began to emerge on the Black Sea coast and the capital Bucharest. In Cluj, uh, local entrepreneurs and music lovers started opening clubs and organizing small electronic music events, taking advantage of the forested mountainous areas surrounded Cluj. Some critics talk of the emergence of a Romanian sound aesthetic that they call raw minimal, a subgenre of minimal tech house. So, how did Cluj go from virtually nothing uh, to two huge EDM festivals attracting, in the case of Untold, um, almost 400,000 participants and the biggest names in the business from Armin van Buren to Steve Aoki, while also um, growing uh, a local scene? Well, I think in mainly three ways. First of all, through political will, through festivalization and through music hybridization. In 2012, um, Cluj's mayor, Emil Bok, returned from Bucharest after a short stint as a prime minister, determined to remake Cluj into an economic powerhouse, a tourist destination, and an IT hub. So we can see here how the economy, um, tourism, and technology start to um, converge. Cluj became European youth capital in 2015. This is an initiative of the Council of Europe uh, that usually comes with uh, important local invest investment and indeed new music and sports venues were purposefully built in 2015. The local administration uh, partnered with local entrepreneurs to organize festivals, controversially investing public money in 2015 in the organization of the first untold festival. Although festivalization is seen problematic by some as a policy um, because it is considered to be unsustainable, environmentally damaging and not supportive enough of local talent, it worked in the case of um, Cluj because it was coupled with touristic initiatives and aggressive social media promotion um, that um, managed to um, transform the festivals into a focal point, uh, bringing Romanian foreign visitors and offering local musicians some international exposure. By hybridizing the music offering, uh, The Prodigy, Florence and the Machine, even Robin Williams have been uh, booked for some of these festivals and hip hop Romanian bands are a recurrent feature. Both Electric Castle and Untold have managed to grow steadily. Participants reported that they were initially attracted by the big names, but it was the festival atmosphere and the new music they were hearing that won them over. 
Even those who didn't recognize names like Avicii wanted to be part of a festival that replicated successful festivals that they would have heard of in Western Europe, such as Tomorrowland or Creamfields. And once familiarity and taste were established, participants started to look for Romanian bands that were playing similar genres, um, like the alternative rock band Vita de Vie or um, the electronic music band Shuya Paparude, which are now well known throughout Romania. So Cruz became quite an interesting example of local cultural development being mediated by transnational culture. The EDM scene in Cluj developed quickly um, due to this bottom-up approach driven by the local audience's quickly evolving taste and thirst for experimentation, to which local entrepreneurs responding by opening genre-specific clubs and starting to invest in, in music events. In parallel, and owing to a shift in local political and economic interests, top-down initiatives began to emerge, including par financial partnerships between the local administration and private entrepreneurs, favorable local policies, including low fees for hiring up public spaces and 24-hour alcohol license licensing, as well as attracting EU funds for development and heritage preservation initiatives. In this case, festival location has also been um, essential uh, Untold, unlike other uh, big festivals, um, takes over the city center. Um, it's not great for the residents, but um, it's very popular as a result with sponsors and, and tourists. While Electric Festival is organized on the domain of the derelict Banfi Castle, which is slowly being restored with EU and festival money, where due to its rural location, attendees are free to party unimpeded in a 24-hour unended um, cycle, also aided by the um, alcohol licensing I already mentioned. More recently, under public and media pressure, there have been interventions to ensure sustainability and the promotion of a green agenda during and in between festivals. Um, and uh, this has included investment in technology uh, to ease sound pollution, venues or schedules slots dedicated to Romanian bands, uh, electric public transport, mass tree planting, zero plastic and other greening initiatives, as well as the establishment of the first mass streets in Romania. So Cruz's example shows that for festivals and music scenes to be sustainable, partnerships are needed between local residents, private entrepreneurs, the local administration, and transnational organizations and companies. And I will end just by referring to what happened in 2020, um, seeing that the um, EDM scene in Cluj really depends um, on these two big uh, annual festivals. Um, well, um, the two festivals didn't run um, they offered refunds uh, or the possibility to swap 2020 passes for any time passes that can be therefore redeemed. Um, and uh, big acts have already booked, have been booked for 2021, so they're obviously um, going ahead. Until Sorry, Alexandra, Alexandra, you'll have to, to, to conclude um, really quickly because we, we, we are a bit running late. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I can also elaborate this in the discussion, but as John was saying um, in the beginning, one of the problem with um, support for uh, music scenes is that the money, um, Romania has a, has a 100 million euro um, investment program in music venues and cultural venues. But obviously, then you're waiting for a long time for the money to trickle down to musicians. So I think probably you know the highlight is that more um, support is is needed um, audiences are eager to return um, but obviously the survival of the scene de 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 depends on intervention thank you so damien is our next panelist uh, damien is an associate professor uh, at city university it's over to you damien okay thank you sebastian so uh, the presentation of today is about uh, Hong Kong and uh, electronic music. So it's based on the chapter we wrote with uh, uh, my colleague uh, Alex Yu uh, for the book uh, we edited with, uh, with Sebastian and John. 
Uh, so the chapter is about is a comparison between uh, Hong Kong and Shenzhen, but uh, my presentation of today is going to be uh, uh, on Hong Kong mainly. Um, so uh, if we want to talk about electronic music in Hong Kong, uh, we can go back uh, in the 90s. Um, there was some kind of a rave culture in Hong Kong that was uh, articulated in a specific fashion. Um, the, the rave music culture was um, um, uh, articulated to canto pop, which, has, which was very prominent uh, in Hong Kong at that time. And so you had a, a kind of an under, you know, a, not really underground culture because it was very popular, but you have all these clubs uh, in the non, uh, you know, uh, uh, central areas of Hong Kong. In, uh, in the peninsula of Kowloon Tong, you would have all these clubs uh, called disco club, but very different from the disco in the 80s, you know, in the States or in Europe. And so these clubs were doing this kind of uh, uh, mixing articulation between uh, canto pop music and, uh, and rave uh, culture. So the club could be called like uh, uh, 838 Disco, Cyber 8, uh, it's... Uh, um, Italy, France, Japan, uh, Gamdo, uh, so different names for this club that were very popular in the 90s uh, until the mid 2000s. And in these clubs, there was uh, electronic uh, music uh, playing. Um, so uh, if we go back a little uh, uh, after this uh, in Hong Kong, you would have, or, or you know, uh, at the same time actually, uh, when you speak about nightlife in Hong Kong, uh, so we can say like it's a metropolis where that, that can never sleep, um, uh, like other big metropolises in the world. But um, uh, in Hong Kong, there is this uh, enter uh, entertainment district called um, uh, Long Kwai Fong, which is uh, in the area of Hong Kong called Central on Hong Kong Island. So it's, it's the most like uh, if you want, like a cosmopolitan uh, slash western um, uh, 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 part of Hong Kong. And this uh, district has been developed by um, uh, Alan Ziman, and it's like a franchise that is uh, repeated uh, uh, in other uh, uh, cities in China uh, to, uh, to, 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 to make like uh, uh, places where there are uh, bars and musics and clubs, etc. So it's like a, a concept. And when you speak about um, uh, 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 dance music or, or, or electronic in music in Hong Kong, people might, might think about the music you can hear from far away in the Long Kwai Fong district in Central. But uh, of course, uh, electronic dance music culture is not limited to that in Hong Kong. So if you move a little bit away from Central, at the periphery of Central, actually there is a club that is 20, you know, maybe, okay, 50 meters away from Central, but that is totally different. Um, you, so you have these clubs that are not, uh, 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 that are not like uh, uh, mainstream uh, dance music, that are more like underground or niche or genre specific forms of electronic music. And they are, you know, at the, at the fringes of Central. So they are still, in Hong Kong islands, but you have to move a little bit away from Long Kwai Fong in order to find them. And the, the more you move away, the more you're going to find some uh, special niche of electronic music uh, in Hong Kong. And the most extreme being uh, the um, uh, late example of, um, um, I, I don't say the name because it's, uh, it's like private, you know, uh, uh, really underground parties. Uh, so, you know, that are not um, legally organized or, and uh, the, these parties have, have the names of floors of buildings. And uh, in, in these uh, uh, um, underground uh, electronic music parties, you would have like more like genre specific and underground forms of music. So that goes with the environment. And it's also far away from central when we are talking about these uh, places of like, uh, you know, illegal uh, electronic music parties. Um, so it's like, let's say to give a, an idea it's maybe like seven kilometers away from central so on the peninsula of hong kong in the new territories uh, so uh, this is a little bit like the the, the image of uh, electronic music in hong kong so you you we can begin with the 90s rave culture articulated to canto pop 
that give rise to specific disco clubs in Hong Kong that are not the disco, uh, you know, it's not like uh, Club 54 in New York, it's very different. And, um, and then there is a development in the 2000 of uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the district of Lang Kwai Fong for more mainstream form of music. And then there is a development of more genre specific and, and niche kind of um, um, electronic music uh, on the fringes of, uh, of uh, the Lang Kwai Fong in central. Uh, to illustrate how um, electronic music in Hong Kong is articulated to the context of Hong Kong. So, you know, Hong Kong is a very uh, concentrated city, a uh, very high density of uh, people living there because the territory is limited and, uh, and there, are, there is uh, 7 million people plus lots of tourism uh, before COVID. Uh, so um, there is a high concentration of people and like elsewhere, uh, for, for, you know, uh, electronic dance music culture, there is a, a problem with space in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to take the, the example of Triple X Club, uh, which was a club existing between 2011 and 2018 in Hong Kong. And that was kind of a staple of electronic music culture in Hong Kong because they were, it was kind of a stable venue in which um, uh, electronic music can play weekly. And so you would have like uh, some really strong forms of community building uh, uh, in Triple X. Uh, they were not only playing electronic music, but it was um, uh, mainly, I would say, uh, different forms of electronic music, uh, uh, not just house and techno, but uh, uh, drum and bass and uh, uh, house, house music and uh, um, uh, deconstructive club music and so, so lots of different genres of electronic music. Da Damien, uh, sorry, you, you have one minute left, so can oh, you wow. conclude? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh so, yeah, so the, this club like changes uh, places three times between 2011 2018, and it began at the fringes of Central, so next to the central part of Hong Kong on Hong Kong Island, and then it ended up in uh, uh, Taikot Soi which is an industrial area on the peninsula of Hong Kong. And uh, it was basically a, a fight for space and a fight to maintain some kind of uh, um, uh, non-mainstream forms of electronic music. So. Thank you, Damien. So our last but not least panelist is Leila Adugilmo. So Leila is an assistant professor at New York University, and she's also a composer. She's passionate about black and indigenous music. And she will be talking to us about electric music in uh, Ghana. Over to you, Leila. Thank you, Sebastian and Damien, uh, for inviting me also to this book. It's very exciting. Um, I'm really excited to be at CTM Festival as well, uh, as we are remotely celebrating. Um, so thank you so much for having us here. So yeah, I just wanted to talk a little about um, Ghanaian music um, as it relates to my chapter in Electronic Cities. So I, um, on my ro most recent trip to Accra, um, I was recording with a musician uh, rapper named Edna, F.G. Edna, you can check her out online. And she kindly invited us to one of the surrounding suburbs uh, of Accra, which is called Kogropide. And as we drove back in the cab, we came to this street party. And I, I guess I wanted to just think about the sound of the street. Um, and I try to relay this in my chapter in the book that um, Accra has this really great restaurant, music, street culture, so that uh, where in the West we might think of, um, in the global North, we might think of music existing solely in nightclubs. In Ghana, it's really part of the fabric of society, dance music and electronic dance music. Um, and because I am a musician and music scholar, I really feel like I wanna play you what I heard on the street here. So I'm gonna try and do that. So just bear with me. Oh, the host disabled screen sharing, so I can't play that for you. <laughs> okay, um, so basically, yeah, what I heard when I was on that street was this kind of really loud dance music with big speakers out there. And I just, it just, part of that made me think about my research over the past, I guess, six or seven years of electronic dance music in Ghana. So um, Ghanaian dance music starts, has a very, very long timeline because African, so as we know, African music is often dance music as well. 
in, our, in African musics, we don't have this bifurcation or split between music for listening and music for dancing. These musics can be the same musics. And in fact, most genres of Ghanaian music are musics for dancing, uh, apart from gospel music, which is a little slower, but basically most music are music for dancing. Um, and so a little about my take on this music. Uh, I think that uh, scholars are in an interesting position. Um, I've personally been part of the electronic dance music scene as a musician, as a hobby DJ, not, a, not an expert DJ, but definitely I've played some shows, uh, and as an audience member for many, many years. And so this, and also I myself um, am, am half Ghanaian. So as an auto-ethnographic subject, I dissect the subject position of the scholar in these uh, communities, which is often, which are often subversive communities, right? So I live in New York right now. I teach at uh, New York University. And uh, in New York, we have these subcultures of uh, black, gay, dance music scenes. And I think that a couple of other speakers have been speaking about this kind of subversive nature of dance music. And so it's important to think of these subversive natures of dance music and dance music culture, which we should protect. Uh, in Ghana, the scene is a little different in that dance music is a very historic music. It's been there for you know uh, at least a hundred years. So the most, uh, popular and well-known form of dance music from Ghana is high life. And that became electronic in the 1980s in a genre called uh, burger high life. It was called burger high life because a lot of Ghanaians moved to where? Hamburg in Germany. So that from the, since the 1980s, the, uh, this Ghanaian music have, have begun to, began to be uh, electronic. Uh, similarly, uh, hip life from Ghana is a, genre of hip, hip, hip hop. So basically Ghanaian started rapping in local languages over hip hop beats from overseas. So from American hip hop. So we, we hear these same kinds of, um, these same kinds of musics, but with Ghanaian language and also starting to bring in some samples of, of Ghanaian acoustic instruments into uh, hip life. So that's where we hear the difference between hip life and hip hop, because there's also Ghanaian hip hop. And so I think it's also important to think now about what kinds of music we talk about as electronic dance music usually, right? So I teach uh, global electronic music at New York University. I also te teach advanced computer music composition. And it's interesting, this historic split between, uh, I guess, black dance music and white dance music. Of course, the beginnings of, of house and techno are from Detroit and Chicago, and these are black scenes, but sometimes that history gets missed out when we talk about these scenes. So it's really important to think about the uh, black origins of these scenes. Um, when we talk about dance music. And that helps us bring in music from the global South. And I would say, especially music from Africa and the diaspora. Um, so uh, yeah, when we think of also about this split between acoustic music and, um, and electronic music. Uh, so a decolonizing perspective demonstrates how uh, the electronic music scene in Accra is progressive and could be supported. And so I speak about that in this book. I think it's really important to think about the concept of the global north and how that counterbalances and highlights Accra's global south subject position outside of it. But then when we think of it that way, we can think about uh, the progressive um, ways that we could be influenced by a country like Ghana. So we take away this sort of paternalistic uh, top-down approach of policy, we start to look at ways that we could be influenced by uh, the Global South, in this case, Ghana. So through the study of spaces in Accra, I, I bring this decentered music to the center of the discussion in electronic dance music as an Afrocentric person myself. So this Afrocentric context reveals that nightclubs, bars, and restaurants with dance music are an elongated historic phenomenon due to the fact that traditional uh, popular Ghanaian dance music genres organically morphed into these electronic genres. Um, Leila, I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, can, can you can you um, stop now because we, we we're gonna have just time for one question. I've okay. just been informed. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. I am so really. So the question I want to ask to the panel is about um, cultural policy. So we've noticed in the book that electronic music is not very well integrated in, into those cultural policies in cities. Um, what, what would be the reason for that? Do you think this music genre is still a bit demonized by local government in cities? And is there a shift towards more acceptance, integration 
Um, yeah, if you could talk about that, that would be great. Who wants to start? Well, in the case of Cluj, that's not, um, that's not the, uh, an issue. Um, but then you have the opposite issue as to whether, you know, this kind of promotion of certain types of music and big names and big musicians and big festivals doesn't actually silence um, bottom up and, you know, local developments. Yes, yeah, Sarah. Well, I'll just say one, one thing that I think I've noticed is the, the link between kind of electronic music and electronic music scenes or what have you with, with the night. So I think that part of the thing is, is when policy is being developed for music, um, I think a lot of people who are doing the policy development are thinking more about daytime spaces. And so that electronic music tends to kind of fall through the cracks in policy development. So that, that's what I've noticed. Um, Stefan, do you want to talk about that? Because you mentioned there were a change in planning towards more acceptance of electronic music. So can you confirm that? Yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, certainly in London, I think the, the question has been taken on board. But obviously, the longer you wait to take things on to test to actually address things properly, you know, and uh, I think probably from a British perspective, part of the problem is that for, for many years and decades, uh, electronic music as uh, a sort of nuisance rather than anything else. So it was all about trying to contain and constrain things, you know, thinking about what time it is until, et cetera. When you start think, thinking about things positively, the whole approach is different and you realize that it's not actually necessary to just contain everything all the time. Uh, so yeah, it's just a changing the frame of mind really, I would say. So Leila, do you want to respond to that as well? I think from your chapter, um, Electronic music in Ghana is more like oh, evolved more organically without any, any policy support. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I guess because Ghana is a lower middle income economy, uh, we're thinking about like a lot of things like water and power and stable in Ghana. So, and building codes and zoning codes, as I speak about in the chapter, are not necessarily taken into account by anybody. They're not really practical. So what people do is speak to the community. So for instance, I spoke to a couple of people who, um, venue owners who are family run venues, they, they run them with their brothers and they go and speak to the community around them as in they go and speak to each person in the neighborhood and say, what time could we finish? Like could 10 p.m. be an okay time to finish playing music? I think in COVID, it's really important to think about these things because if we look at if we look to cultures that have existing scenes that are organic, we could find out ways and learn from them about ways that work with the community rather than trying to enforce anything from the top down. I think COVID does give us in its tragedy, there could be spaces to bring on uh, you know, communities and cultures that work in, in different ways, yeah. Yes, John. Well, this is a bit sort of historic, really. Uh, where I live in Brisbane, uh, there are, there are uh, a, there's a Valley Entertainment precinct. So there's a, that is um, state government and local government, um, both supporting the notion of, uh, of nightclub uh, activity and, and uh, its relationship with, um, with residents. But uh, there, there's also a, a really good sort of negative historical um, aspect around policy uh, due to violence um, as the through the 90s and 2000s as the uh, nighttime sort of uh, exploded in the three capital cities, Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. All three cities developed um, lockout laws. They were applied in different ways in the different cities. Um, uh, in Brisbane, for instance, the uh, clubs were closed at three o'clock and then reopened at six o'clock. And it was meant to kind of stop uh, a lot of that kind of um, uh, club hopping really in those hours between three and six because there was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, people were being um, uh, single punch. Um, um, uh, killed and so forth. There's a lot of problems. The lockout laws didn't work. Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, the the sort of public emphasis was on the fact that this, these were rather than live music venues, these were uh, nightclub um, issues, and uh, there was no evidence to support that. And and in fact, the uh, they'd been abandoned in all three cities, and um, uh, due to uh, really just uh, uh, 
um, big rallies in Melbourne, you know, uh, 10,000 people on the streets, that sort of thing. Um, uh, people supporting their uh, venues rather than uh, these uh, lockout laws, which didn't work at all. So it's kind of like a, uh, an example of a, uh, you know, how, how policy can, uh, can also be uh, pointless. So my other question, and maybe Damien, you can start on this question. My other question is, um, would you say that electronic music is a music genre in itself? Or would you rather say it needs to be studied in connection with all the genre in the city? I think the book shows a lot that um, a lot of the chapter are connecting electronic music to other genres. So what is your take on that, Damien, for Hong Kong? Um, uh, OK, if, if I... Uh, um, yeah, in, in Hong Kong, it's connected to 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 other genres, but um, um, uh, let, let, let's say like um, I, I will take more like the the, the example of, um, uh, for instance, in Paris, like the French touch in electronic music has like roots in punk uh, that are well known. Um, in Hong Kong, I cannot think of such straightforward link. But uh, for sure, there is like, uh, for instance, in the 80s in Hong Kong, you have like uh, mixed media practices with performances, like John was describing uh, in his presentation in, in Brisbane. You have this also in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, um, you, you have a diversity of subgenre inside electronic music in Hong Kong, but I'd, I'd, uh, um, I cannot see, for instance, link between, you know, um, okay. uh, rap communities and um, electronic music in Hong Kong. Uh, it's more like a diversity of subgenre in electronic music that are doing things okay. like that. And, yeah. and, and Sarah, in the case of Toronto, did you did you notice any connection between drum and bass and other non-electronic genre? Or is it just a community by itself? How would you describe the drum and bass community in Toronto? Yeah, I mean, definitely con connected to other electronic music scenes. but I. I think that there can, there's a lot of um, communication between, uh, you know, event producers and so on for what kind of spaces to use. And so that, you know, that is beyond electronic music. So that's what I mentioned, the DIY spaces, which, you know, can have electronic music. They can also be, you know, many different kinds of genres. So I think, you know, within a DIY space, you get a lot of overlap in spatial uses and, you know, policy for that um, between many different kinds of music. And Stefan, you mentioned the link with the punk music. Is it really strong between acid techno and punk, or is it a thin link, or how would you describe it? I think it's it's there as you know part of the culture, but mostly because, as I said, a number of the pioneers of the scene were and still active in in, in the punk scene. But I think, in terms of crossovers between between genres, what what I would really highlight is the fact that, and, and this is specifically true in the in the squad party culture. Uh, typically, during the squad party, you would get you know six or seven different spaces. I wouldn't call them rooms, but you know what I mean. Um, and and all genres mix. I mean, you would get an ambient place to chill out. You could get you know, uh, a jungle drum and bass, you would get techno, hot techno, acid techno, perhaps even Cytron. So I think clearly, although each uh, member of the public who goes to these parties probably has a preference, it's, I, I would argue, it would be useless to study these genres as something separate. You really need to look at the wider picture because it, it, it all mingles really, even yeah. in terms of the machines, you know, the 808, which is used in electro music, it was originally used for hip hop. So it's, it's all, you know, it's all a mix really. And, and my last question would be about um, the type of music. So with the COVID and would that be the end of celebratory EDM music for festival? And are we gonna go towards more introspective electronic music? What is your take on that? I mean, Leila, do you wanna talk about that? In, maybe in the case of Ghana, I don't know. Um, do you yeah. think we, the, the type of music will change? Uh, yeah, well, first off, Ghana hasn't been so hit by COVID. There's different scientific reasons why that is, but it hasn't been so hit. And the other thing is that a lot, like I said, a lot of this music is indoor, outdoor kind of flow. Uh, maybe that's more easy to do in somewhere hot like Australia than somewhere cold like Toronto. But, I, you know, where I come from in New Zealand as well, there is this history of outdoor dance parties. So I think... Um, I imagine we might get something more like between the world uh, world wars where people really do want to get together and party and, and do things in the ways that they can because we're still human and we still want to dance. If anything that we could learn from Ghana, it's that 
to stop separating dancing from life. Yeah. Anyone wants to say a final word about this question of the change in music? I would say that um, I've, I've noticed that um, some of this scene has moved online. Um, I think uh, similarly with Ghana, Romania has quite a, a summer party atmosphere um, and I don't think that will stop. But I think that COVID somehow made people aware that there are all these um, spaces online that are available for free once you've got an internet connection and, um, you know, um, a lot of interesting, exciting things happening online. Okay. Yes, Stefan. Yeah, I'm sorry. This might sound a bit depressing, but I think one one of the things I'm starting to think about really is is the extent to which all of these online events are perhaps starting to make things worse. In the sense that you know, at some stage, I think they were absolutely vital for many people, public, you know, members of the public, artists, to to try and keep the link. But the more you look at things online, the more you realize that you miss the actual thing, you know, the physical thing, the experience. So it, it's just the thought. But, you know, for the moment, it's keeping everyone going. But I don't, that, I don't know if you all agree. Don't mean to be depressing, but... Anita, I think we've covered quite a lot. Are we st still have time or...? Yeah, we are still in the middle of an online event, so it goes further. And I just wanted to ask you, Sebastian, can you give us an update when the book will be published? Um, it's going well, so I'm hoping uh, March, still March, uh, maybe before, but yeah, March, definitely. Yeah. Very so, soon we can read a little bit more about those different case studies and policies and so on. Thank you so much to all of you for staying with us and discussing this really important topic, I would say. So very soon we will be able to read a little more about this topic very precisely from March. And thank you so much also for the moderation, Sebastian. It was really great. And um, I wish you all morning, evening, afternoon, depending on the time zone you are at right now. And um, back to the studio also for the people who were staying with us throughout the whole thing, don't go so far because Sebastian is going to be on Discord, which is going to be a little chat. So if you have still some questions also for the audience at home, then you can address them via chat on Discord. So Sebastian will be there and answer those questions. So have a lovely afternoon for the Berlin uh, viewers. And in 45 minutes, we are back with the fourth session. So don't go too far.